Good morning. Thanks for the invitation to speak here. Uh, thank you for coming early on a Monday. And <coughs> what I would like to talk about is indeed freezing. And this is joint work with uh, Eliran Subag. He's a student at Weizmann. And I, I would like to start with a few examples. Um, in fact, why am I speaking in English? OK. <laughs> Is there a good reason? Yes, there is, there is a good reason. <laughs> Gadi. No. Gadi now is an expert in French. <laughs> Il parle français très très bien. <laughs> okay, we'll continue. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so I would like to start with a few examples. So, so the first example is what physicists call REM and what we should call IID random variables. So what is a REM? It's XI, which are IID, um, of unbounded support uh, with exponential tails plus some conditions on the tails. But for our discussion, just think, instead of all this long thing, just think of them as being normal 0, 1. OK? So everything I'm going to say next is going to, uh, to, to be specific to that case, although this is not essential. And now you can define the point process, which is So you will note a certain scaling, uh, which is easy to guess. Um, this scaling happens to work. Uh, actually, this scaling happens not to work, but this one will. And um, <clears throat> so that's a point process, which is formed from xi. mn is a certain centering. And we choose the centering mn such that in fact, it relates to the edge of this point process. So in particular, we might take mn to be just the expectation of the maximum of square root n xi. OK. And it is well known, so well known, that Xi n converges to a certain Xi to a certain point process, which is a Poisson point process with intensity with a C explicit that I don't remember and therefore don't want to write it. And this is in the sense of vague convergence. If you take a function of compact support and you integrate against the point process, you will have a convergence of these random variables. So the picture you should have in mind is that we have these points. And of course, these points begin to accumulate towards minus infinity. But what you have is locally finite. So in any compact neighborhood, you have a finite number of points. OK. There must be some gizmo that does it electron, right? Those? Yes. OK. Good. So that's the first example. And there are generalizations of this convergence to what is called the GRAM, the generalized random energy model in which the, uh, uh, the random variables are created the sums of random variables, but I don't want to discuss that. 
or to even introduce it here. The second example is the example of branching Brownian motion or branching random walks. So here, so, so I guess for this audience, I don't need to define what I mean by that. It's, you, you start with a particle, you let it evolve for, say, uh, if it's in discrete time, you just let it do a move, then it splits, each of the particles does their own move, they split, etc., etc. By time n, if you start in discrete, you have 2 to the power n particles, and you, c you do essentially the same. So you take psi n, which is a sum of delta xi n minus mn. And that's much more, the theorem I'm going to quote is much more recent than what I'm saying up there. So this has several authors attached to it. many of which are in the audience. And then you have um, Brunet and Xi, uh, who dealt, these two groups of authors dealt with uh, the branching Brownian motion part of the story. And then Madul dealt with a branching random walk part of the story. So I would write here 2010 to 2013. So the earlier date is the date that this paper started appearing on archive. And I think 2013 is probably the publication date. So Xi n converges to some point process Xi, or zeta. Uh, but uh, the limit process has a more complicated uh, description. So the, the description of this process consists of three, of three components. The first one is that you have xi, which are points of a Poisson point process with this density. Then, to each such point, you have attached uh, D, which is a point process, a D for decoration. So note that there are only two Ps now. It's a, it's a point process, not a Poisson point process. And DI are IID copies of D. And finally, you have a random variable z. <coughs> so those are the three ingredients you need in order to describe the process. One is a, a Poisson point process, the decoration, and the shift. And what you get then is a point process, a description that psi is just the sum over i So the picture you should keep in mind is the following. So really, the picture you should keep in mind is the following. You have your point processes. You, you have the points of the Poisson process xi, which kind of accumulate towards the edge. Then, to each point, you attach their own decoration. And finally, so this is a decoration of the first point, and then here you have maybe a decoration of the second point, etc., etc. So I hope it's clear how this proceeds. So this was for the first point. That is the blue point, and the red process is a decoration of the second process, etc., etc. 
And at the end, you shift the whole process by one random variable, z. I forgot to mention, all these three ingredients are independent of each other. Okay? And we will call this structure a shifted decorated Poisson point process. And of course, it comes with parameters, so the parameters are c, d, and z. This gives you a description of this process. Yes? Yes, I subtract, I do not subtract the max itself. I do subtract a deterministic uh, quantity. It's a different description. Of course, if you subtract the max, then you will, it cannot be of this type. Because this type has a positive probability of having points, positive points in particular. The same, same, you subtract, you sub, you subtract mn not the max itself. If you want to get a Poisson point process, you cannot subtract the max. Certainly not if you want to get a Poisson, let me rephrase. You cannot get a, a, a Poisson point process with intensity e to the minus x if you subtract the max, because all points will be negative. Okay? There are descriptions also of the process viewed from what you're talking about, the process viewed from the edge, but I do not want to discuss that now, okay? Now, a similar picture emerges in other situations. So another situation is, maybe this is C, two-speed uh, branching Brownian motion or branching random or vari variable speed uh, BBM. Um, this was analyzed by Bouvier and Hartog recently. So this is 13, 14. And essentially the same picture ar arises. I should say that you should, so what do I, first of all, let me describe what I mean by two-speed uh, two BBM. Uh, what I mean by that is take a time interval, let's say T, macroscopic, and now have the Brownian motion move with one variance, call it sigma one, up to time, say T half, and with another variance, call it sigma two, up from T half to T. So it's a macroscopic change of the profile of the Brownian motion. And this process has some interesting features that I don't want to discuss right now. Uh, suffices to say that you should distinguish between sigma 1 larger than sigma 2 and sigma 1 smaller than sigma 2 where sigmas are the variances in the first half of the time and the second half of the time. Uh, this case, where sigma one is larger than sigma two, uh, following a discussion with Anton Bouvier, I decided to call this the Baroque case. And the Baroque is because the decoration is heavier than the process itself. So you have an underlying uh, exponential, a Poisson with exponential weight, and then you have the decoration. In this case, the decoration has a heavier tail. It, if you go far away to the past, the decoration dominates the process, whereas this is non-Baroque. Okay. But both of them, for me, belongs to the same class. I do not distinguish in this talk between the two. Finally, the last example, and actually my entry point into this problem, this kind of problems, is a discrete Gaussian free field. So uh, the discrete Gaussian free field is a, a Gaussian process which is indexed by uh, lambda n uh, box in Z2. 
with covariances given by the green function of the random walk in that box and maybe zero boundary conditions or some kind of boundary condition to make it concrete. And here the situation is the following. You can take, um, so fix kn, which is much, much larger than 1, and much, much smaller than n. And by these signs, I mean in the logarithmic sense. So the log of kn is much, much smaller than the log of n. And create the point process xi n exactly the same. So I'm not distinguishing, I'm sorry. I'm I'm being messy here. I'm not distinguishing well between capital and lowercase letters. So you create the same object. And here it's a theorem due to Biscoop and Luidor. Uh, last year, that Psi n, uh, can you see if I write down here or not, or barely? Okay? So Psi n converges to a process Psi, and this Psi is an SDPP C0, oh, sorry, delta 0, Z. So really, the D should not be here. So no decoration. This is the result. And theorem in progress of the same authors. So maybe I should say here 14, 14, 15. I'm not exactly sure when the progress <laughs> will end, but it's clear that the correct answer is it. So, so oh, I forgot to say, I didn't say what is the role of a KN, sorry. Uh, by this, I mean that you only take um, um, V local maxima. So what I mean by that is that XV of N that I take in the sum is maxima, maximum, in a box of side kn. OK? So you, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. And indeed, it would be confusing without it. So you just look at local maxima of the process. You do not take the whole process. If you want, I mean, there are many ways to do it. Either you, dec you just look at each point and ask, is it a local maximum or not? Or essentially, the same result would also be achieved if you just divide space into boxes of size kn, and you pick the maximum in each box. They do need to go to infinity. Yes, it's very important. And, they, and of course, they shouldn't go to infinity too fast. For example, there shouldn't be the whole, sp the whole thing. <coughs> okay. Yes. So in the, in this result, you do not uh, need, and then um, and then uh, um, you will get that. Okay. So uh, the basic question I want to um, address. Because I only take the local maximum. So, so I did not, I did not, um, I did not plan to. But since you asked, so let me explain what is going on. There is a result for the GFF that uh, um, that essentially points that are close to the maximum are either neighbors in terms of physical distance or macroscopically apart. So to be more precise, if you fix a constant, epsilon, I can compute for you a, another constant, c of epsilon. And I can assure you that any point which is within distance 
I don't know, 1 over epsilon below mn is going either to be within c of epsilon of each other or within n divided by c of epsilon of each other, okay? So the correlations disappear, you come back to essentially to rem, except that you have a general field that is added to all variables at order one from the beginning, and this is what is uh, creating a shame. Okay. So, so, uh, and, and of course, and, and uh, okay, so since you opened that door, uh, the, the, the effort going from Kn increasing to Kn equal 1 is essentially to prove that the local point process around the point conditions that the point is high, so that the point is a near maximum, does not depend on the value of the conditioning. If I could show that, okay, then, and that's at the heart of the matter in this kind of results, or at least in the approach in over there. And, and the same is true here, without doubt. It's just not written yet. Okay, so the basic question is, when do we have SDPP? As I wrote here, in progress. Ah, uh, Kn equal 1 as dpp. Okay? So that if you take, uh, thank you, if you take boxes of size 1, namely you take all points, then you get the sdpp. Of course you can, you can do any, once you have that you can do any intermediate thing. Right? Take a box not of size 1 but of size 25 and take the local maxima there, then you will get a, a decorated Poisson point process. What will change is the uh, decorations. Okay. Okay, so that's the first part of the title, and freezing did not show up yet. So now we are going to introduce freezing. So maybe for that. Okay. So the freezing phenomenon is something that was observed first, to the best of my knowledge, by Derrida and Spohn. And it goes more or less like that. So suppose I have a point process. And now I can construct So this is essentially a shifted version of the partition function associated to the process, assuming that, the pros that this object is finite and well-defined. In general, xi may be a sequence of processes, so then you will have a sequence of such quantities z beta. And then there are several notions of freezing. So one weak notion of freezing is that if you have a, an n here, so that you'll have an n, then one weak notion of freezing would be this notion, that this converges to something, and what it converges it uh, so let's call it, uh, uh, okay, the y here is not playing too much of a role, so it's going to be e to the minus beta, uh, sorry, it's going to be something like y plus something, and what is here does not depend on beta, if beta is larger than beta critical, for some value of beta critical. This is one notion of reason that appears in the physics literature. I'm not going to discuss this notion because as, we, as, I will, as it will turn out to be not strong enough for our needs. So in fact, the theorems are wrong if you take the counterexample to the theorems if you take this notion. 
This is a general notion for general uh, uh, point processes. It has nothing to do now with a particular example. You take a point process, you form that, you take n to infinity or sequence of point processes, and you say that freezing occurs if you have this phenomenon. Okay. Um, actually, I guess there is no why in this particular in this particular example. There is no why. Okay, so what I want to consider is a stronger notion of freezing, which was introduced by Derrida and Spohn. That's way back, so that's in 88. And what they did was define the following quantity. So they took the Laplace transform of this quantity. So this is now you don't need a limit for that. So this is a function of beta and y. Okay? And what they proved so for the rem There exists an M of beta and T. Well, T is uh, what I called, uh, so I guess I should call it N, such that G beta, uh, maybe I should put here an N of Y, Y plus M of beta N converges. And, and this is the freezing part, for beta larger than beta critical, G beta of Y is G beta C of Y. So the remarkable part here is that this Laplace transform, except for a recentering, does not depend on beta if beta is large enough. And this is a phenomenon that I will call freezing. Or at least this is the one that I will call DS freezing. For Derrida Spohn freezing. Okay? So, uh, and this was extended, so this result that is written here was extended for branching Brownian motion by Webb a few years ago. And there is a small uh, interest in the physics, uh, there is a belief in the physics literature that somehow um, the <coughs> Gaussian fields that are log correlated whatever that means, because of, you know, that also can be discussed. But that Gaussian fields that are log correlated do exhibit this type of freezing. So log correlated Gaussian fields should have the following properties, should have freezing. And this actually was proved, so this, the names, the physics names attached to it are Carpentier and Le Dussal. And, uh, and also Fyodorov and Bouchot. There are various examples of such results in this papers. And this was proved for the so-called star-scaled models, which are a particular type of log-correlated fields, by Madol, Vargas, and Rhodes. And the general belief is that 
somehow this kind of freezing, uh, so this kind of DS freezing, is more or less synonym to the following things. First, you have a, a DS PPP extremal process. And the maximum of that extremal process is a shifted gamble, is a shift of a gamble by an independent random variable. Okay. So the general belief is, therefore, that this is the answer. The answer to the question, when is DPPP, is when you have DS freezing. That's kind of an underlying belief. By the way, some people believe that this is true, that with wi this weak notion of freezing, you also have the same result. This is wrong. We have a counterexample. So you should not really think that any freezing would give to an, SD an SDPP process. OK. So after this long introduction, to put things, sorry? Yeah, I guess, yes. I guess you can, in the IID case, I guess you can compute it, yeah. I don't remember, but I'm sure it is. I mean, I'm sure one can compute it. Okay, good. took the wrong board, never mind. Okay, so unfortunately I cannot prove this result. We cannot prove that result. So we need to introduce yet another notion of freezing, and since this can get a bit confusing, I, I will write all the definitions and keep them on the board. So if I try to erase them, please scream and shout and tell me that I shouldn't. So here are some definitions. We say that F is equivalent to G if there exists a constant CF such that f of y minus cf is g of y, okay? So this is the equivalence up to shifts. The second object that I will need is an analog of what appeared in the, the Riedersporn object, except that I will allow general functions. And here, in general, f will be positive, and often it will be comp uh, um, continuous and compact support. Not always it will be compact support. For example, in the derrida spon setup, it is not of compact support. It blows up, and it, it blows up at minus infinity. And so, in particular, the, the Riedersporn freezing is a statement about L psi of e to the beta, e to the beta x. Okay. And we say that L psi is uniquely supported on G if L psi of F is synonym to G. Okay, so that's a property we saw before. You get the same function except for the shift. You stick in different Fs, you get the same functions again to the shift. The last thing is a gamble of y is simply the function, this function. And of course, this function appears 
in extreme value theory. So this is not a surprising function to see here. Oops. Sorry. Okay, so these I want to keep. So I guess I will stop moving the boards. <laughs> and now we introduce several conditions. So the condition uniquely supported is simply that L psi of f similar to g. So here I'm saving notation by not writing the brackets and everything, but I guess it's clear what I mean. It's the same object that I defined up there. Then shifted uniquely supported means L psi means uniquely supported plus g of y of a special form. <coughs> so if you want, it's shifted. And the third property is that Xi is SDPP with some parameters C, D, and Z. And those are all independent. And finally, I introduce a tail condition with, for lack of better name, I will call A4, which tells you that law limit as y goes to infinity of g of x plus, oh sorry, as x goes to infinity. Is e to the minus cy. <coughs> so this is a condition on the tail of the SDPP. So now I can write the theorem. Actually, can everybody see what I'm writing here? Okay. So this is a theorem that I would like to announce. So first, the direct part. If you have an SDPP process, then you have these properties. So you have freezing in this sense. Ah, I forgot to say F uh, in CC plus. Okay, so, so the process being SDPP is related to freezing in the sense, at least it implies freezing, okay? In the strong sense, namely in the sense that you must have the function G, which is a convolution of Gumbel, and you must have this, uh, you actually also, of course, have this, then you, of course, have this tail condition. This tail condition becomes trivial. And then you have the converse part. And the converse, you have to assume A4. So you need to know some information about the tail of this function G. And the theorem is three parts. First of all, if you know SUS, then you have SDP. So if you know freezing plus 
this structure of the function g, you have um, you have an SDP. Weaker than that, if you don't know the structure of G that well, except for tail conditions, what you have is that uniquely supported implies that Xi is a shift of Psi. So the, the process Xi, the point process we are dealing with, is a shift of Psi, where Psi is a decorated Poisson point process, no shift. So why is it not an SDPP? Because Z might depend on Psi. So the only difference is that the Z might depend on Psi. OK. <coughs> The third part of the theorem is that if you have the derrida sponge freezing, so again, under A4, A4 is crucial. Without tail conditions, we cannot say anything. So if you have DS freezing plus US, so now just freezing, you don't tell me anything about the structure of the freezing, just that there is a freezing. Then you have SUS. In several examples, it is not too hard to prove this type of freezing. And then you don't need additional condition. And the last part of the theorem is that if you have US plus some tail conditions, so we have a variety of different additional tail conditions, I will write one of them. There exists an alpha such that Xi of minus Y infinity divided by alpha of Y converges to C in probability. So this, this is just a law of large numbers. Okay, so you know that the number of points you have. For example, for a point process, for a Poisson point process, this certainly holds true. Then you get SUS. And therefore, because of part one, you have SDPP. Okay? Okay, so this is not a completely satisfactory answer in that we believe that at least under this strong condition, Ah, this cannot happen. Namely, you cannot have that Z. We do not have a construction of a process in which uh, the Z you get here is actually dependent on the process. But we have not been able to rule this out. Okay, so I finished now the first 10 minutes of my talk. <laughs> so, so it's a good time to make some amplifying remark. Um, Let's see, this is the bottom one. So, good. Okay, I guess I caused already damage. It's blocked. Okay, <laughs> so I want to make some amplifying remarks, and then I plan to give you at least a sketch of the proof. I'm not sure I'll have time today, but maybe I'll change my plan, and tomorrow we'll give you more on the proof. Okay, it's popular demand. You come to talk to me and tell me if you want to hear about the proof or you want to hear about Leoville Brownian motion, and according to that, I'll prepare my talk for tomorrow. Okay, so some remarks. So uh, all this is tied to invariance process, uh, invariance properties of uh, of processes. So for example, Liget. So you can think of freezing as some type of invariance property of the process. It's invariant under certain uh, certain operations, at least the Laplace transform is. 
And this comes to a family, so I want to convince you that this is related to a family of such objects. So suppose that you have a point process such that the process X is equal in, so. So suppose that you have a point process such that if you add to each point an IID random variable, then you get the same point process. Then it's a result of Liget in the mid-90s, I'm not sure exactly the year, that this is a Poisson So I don't know why I put here a bar. Uh, is Poisson point process with intensity which is e to the minus e to the minus cx or e to the plus cx or even c equals zero, namely Lebec. <coughs> so a related property more recent, this was emphasized by Maillard, although this is implicit in the literature earlier, that if you have x, which is theta a x1 plus theta b x2, so now I'm writing things in the language of point processes. <coughs> this is a shift by a, this is a shift by b, and A and B satisfy this, then X is a decorated Poisson point process with some decoration. And of course, this is a particular case of what we are discussing, and it's easy to check that this condition applies what we said SUS, with z equal zero, with no extra shift. The third property I want to emphasize is that SDPP implies that the maximum is shifted gamble. So by shifted gamble, I mean you take a gamble random variable and you add to it an independent random variable. So this is part of uh, the definition. Yes? Uh -huh. X1 and X2 are independent copies of the same process. I'm sorry. And if X is equal in distribution, yes. Now it makes maybe sense. So if x is equal in, in distribution to this sum of independent copies shifted, then you have this process. And one last, actually, property that I find amusing and that I would like to leave as riddle is the following. So I'm not going to speak about the proof now, but as I said, maybe tomorrow. So here is an amusing, an amusing point. <laughs> so if you look at one of the one of the papers of Fyodorov and uh, Bouchot, and also later later with Keating, they have two papers on this model. Is a model in which they do the following: they take the continuous GFF. They integrate it on circles. They create this way a logarithmically correlated Gaussian field. But because of the special structure, they can do all sorts of amazing computations, apply replica method, take the usual limits that they do, etc. And they can compute the law of maximum. Okay, I'm cheating. They never compute the law of maximum. They prove freezing. They say freezing implies that the maximum is a shifted gamble with an explicit relation between the freezing. If you assume that everything I told you is true, then you can compute the law of the maximum from the freezing, from the function g. 
and the shift you get. So since they compute the function g, they compute the shift, they can compute the, the limit of the maximum. And they get the following. where k1 is a Bessel function. Okay. So this is what they get. It's a computation, pretty long, non-rigorous, but still it leads to an explicit closed form formula. Now the question is, what is this? They leave it at this. This is a result of the computation. And I'm not quite clear how Eliran found that, but in fact, if you open Gumbel's paper, He showed that f is a distribution function. So this is, uh, I don't know, this is uh, 2010, roughly. And this is, I don't remember, but in the 30s. And he showed that f is simply Gumbel convolved with Gumbel. Okay. Now, why would Gumbel care about a convolution of Gumbel with Gumbel? Because he asks the following very simple question. You have IID random variables. We know by extreme value theory, in fact, partly due to Gumbel, that if you have good exponential tails, the maximum will be Gumbel distributed. And what Gumbel asked is, what is the distribution of the maximum minus the minimum? And of course, this is essentially a sum of two independent gumbles. So, this is a maximum of IID minus a minimum of IID. And, okay, of course, <laughs> Fyodorov and Bouchot did not recognize this as that. It's quite, I mean, I, I, as I said, I'm not quite sure how Liran made the connection. It's, it's, it's just a formula in the middle of Gumbel's paper. It doesn't, it doesn't appear in the abstract or anything. But this hints that somewhere in this log correlated field, you should be able to find something like a difference of maximum and minimum. That's a riddle. Where? This I cannot do. I mean, you can follow this non rigorous computation. It will give you a maximum minus, it will give you this function, this distribution. But the riddle is to understand wh where is the maximum minus the minimum? Why does it appear? Why is the shift of the uh, maximum a gambled itself? So this is a riddle. And I think uh, this is a good point to stop. I'm running out of time. Yes, please. <laughs> no, because you don't have a good description of the decoration. In order to understand the second maximum, you need not only to know that it's a, an SDPP, but you need to know the decoration. And the decoration you do not get just from the freezing. There is no nice expression uh, of the decoration into I mean you, you can you can express the shift <coughs> yes and maybe I should say that you can that's not quite true what I said if you have the function cf the shift that comes from f you can say something but of course what they what they do they never use the decora the freezing in the sense I've introduced today they use the derrida spawn freezing they use the answer that the Rida Spon freezing is the same as Gumbel, etc. And, uh, and there you definitely do not get a good description. Okay. So to, to what, um, I think I can speak louder. <laughs> <laughs> to, so this result uh, there to applies to what? So it's, you take the continuous uh, GFF okay. and you integrate it on a circle. 
And that gives you a well-defined function and to that, that type of process. And you take a limit, an appropriate uh, truncation of that. I mean, we tried, we, we, we thought about this for a while. I mean, it's, it's really intriguing. And, and uh, um, but I, I mean, if I knew how to do it, I would tell you. <laughs> I, we, just, we just don't see how, what, how it appears, except that, I mean, it's too pretty to be an accident. <laughs> but maybe it is an accident, I don't know. It would be a stupid question, but I, in all the examples you, <laughs> you gave at the beginning, yes. I didn't see the freezing. Uh, maybe there's something that... No. The word so, freezing? What do you mean? Well, the word or the... So it is so, like so the proof or... So no, freezing... What you explained at the end with the, 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 all the examples you gave at the beginning. So, so all these examples were examples in which you got SDPPP. Yes, DPPP. Yes. So and therefore, they satisfy freezing by the direct part of the theorem. Oh, so, so that's. But in, in their proof, in, in the, they, they use this, this notion of freezing to prove the SDPP. Or well, they didn't have. Of course not, because this theorem is posterior to the proof. No, no, I know, I know. <laughs> so actually, yes, elements are already there. Elements are al already there. So, for example, if you look at, uh, at uh, uh, Madol's proof of the result on branching random walk. What he's doing, he's shifting the process by something explicit that he holds in his hand, which is a derivative martingale. And he shows that that process, after that particular shift, is, uh, um, satisfies the assumptions that of B over there, this invariance property. OK, so, so which is a type of? Freezing. This translates immediately to a type of freezing. Okay, so in this special case, some types of this. Of, of yes, 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 yes. So, so I mean, this notion is hidden. I'm, I'm not trying to say that this notion is hidden in 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 current treatment. Our hope, actually, is that this clarifies a little bit the role of freezing, and maybe in more complicated situations, it will be easier to show something like that than to directly attack. Of course, I mean. This, there is no claim that this is the case. Other questions? Okay, so thank you. Yesterday, so I'll do it here. So I remind you the direct part was just a statement that if you have Xi, which is with parameters, I'll take C equal 1 just for simplicity. It's just a rescaling, D and Z. Then L Xi of F, that this function is the same regardless of what f you take, up to a shift. Okay, so that's what I want to, to show. So let me remind you what that is. That is the expected value of e to the minus sum f of xi minus y, where xi are the points of the point process. And because this is an SDPP, you can uh, rewrite it as the expected value of the expected value of e to the minus sum f of xi of psi i minus y minus z, where psi i is a dppp, namely not shifted. Okay, so remember this process has three components: a Poisson point process with exponential rate e to the minus x, a decoration for each point, and then a global shift. So psi is just like psi, but without the shift, with z equals zero. Okay? And this, of course, so this is the expectation given the shift, um, given z. And now, of course, uh, given z, 
if the psi process satisfies freezing, then what we will have is that this will be the integral of the law of under z of a function which is g of y minus z minus cf. Right? Condition on z, this is just a shift, so call this y prime. This expectation is with respect to the psi process, because part of the definition of this process is that psi and z are independent. And therefore, you will get this quantity, and of course, this quantity is shift invariant. Right? So if I define now g hat to be g hat of y to be the integral of new dz g of y minus z, then what is written here is just g hat of y minus cf. Okay? So it's enough to prove the result when z equals zero. So that's the first step. Okay? So I started from a process which is SDPP. I said, uh, the, if, if it is SDPP, then it is a shift of a DPP process. If I prove the result for the DPP, I'm done. So now I only need to prove it for the DPP process. And then it's just a computation. Question? Okay, so... Uh, so now you fix t finite and define i of t to be those points i such that psi i, okay, maybe I should write it psi i, is larger than minus t. So this is a locally finite uh, set. And um, um, no, not psi i. Excuse me. Um, so those are the points of the Poisson process. Okay? So, so not without the decoration. So remember, we are now in the setup where we need to understand the process psi, and the process psi is a Poisson point process decorated by the eyes. So I denote by WIs the Poisson, the points of the Poisson point process. Okay, and uh, therefore I of T is just Poisson E to the minus T, uh, E to the plus T. Right? So it's just the integral of the density over the interval minus T to infinity. Okay. Now, conditioned on I of T, the WIs are IID, and their density is like minus T plus EI, where this EI are exponential 1. This is just the fact that oh, those are points of a Poisson process. Therefore, if I need to compute the expected value of e to the minus sum f of psi i minus y, I can rewrite it as the expected value of e to the minus sum over i, now j in uh, di, and here I'll have f of wi plus yij minus y. Well, yij are just the decorations attached to the process, okay? And they are independent across now, across i's. Okay. Okay, so, um, okay, up to a truncation. So by truncation, I mean instead of taking here the sum over all i, take the sum only over i such that uh, wi is larger than minus t. Okay? So the same thing here, and because now we have independence with respect to i, 
Okay, we have a Poisson uh, process, and then the WIs are independent. This is the same as the expected value of the expected value of E to the minus sum is just this. Okay? So I wrote here, the, the, this is now a product, if I condition on i of t, this is a product of independent random variables. Okay? The independent random variables being the wi's, conditioned on i of t. So wi, remember, was minus t plus e. So here it is. And we're just raising the expected value to the power i of t. Okay? And now for Poisson point process, we know that the expectation, uh, not Poisson point process, for Poisson random variable, the expectation of um, theta to the power i is simply e to the power e to the power t times theta minus 1, where e to the power t is a parameter of our Poisson. This is just a parameter of the Poisson. Okay, so you can raise this up. Um, let me finish right. Let me finish writing this here. So in particular, what we get <coughs> is just um, the um, so this is equal. I'm now doing the uh, outer expectation. I'll get the expo exp exponential of e to the power t, which is our parameter of the Poisson, times the expected value of this object. But what is this? This is just LD of f um, um, plus t minus e. This is really what is written here. Because this is the expectation with respect to the point process and with respect to E. It's the expectation with respect to the decoration and uh, E. And this is, uh, um, this can be um, um, rewritten as the exponential of the integral from minus t to infinity of e to the minus t ld. Now I'm taking the expectation with respect to this random variable. Ah, there's a minus 1 missing here. I forgot the minus one that was here. Okay? And now you can make the change of variable. Y minus t goes to uh, uh, y prime. And you will get that this is the exponential of the integral um, e to the minus y. And then you'll have an integral. I do not write here um, minus t, I guess t goes to t minus y, so it's going to be plus y, something like that. And now you'll have LD of f Okay, and now you take t to infinity. Okay, so now you take t to infinity, and you'll get the exponential of e to the minus y times the integral from minus infinity to infinity. y has disappeared here, so it's just a constant. So here you will have uh, e to the power cf. And in particular, you got both the representation of uh, the um, 
the solution and the fact that it's a gamble, right? What is written here is just a deterministically shifted gamble. Why is it deterministically shifted? Because we already got rid in the beginning from the random shift. So the proof I wrote here was for the case of shift equals zero. I already showed you that if you have a random shift, you will get the same result except with a randomly shifted gamble. Okay, so I just wanted to do that. So that's an example of the type of computations. Let me also say that in order to prove the theorem in the converse direction, the approach will not be a surprise to those who thought about such things. What you do is you condition the process to have a point very far towards plus infinity, so, so at a big positive value. And then, because everything is determined from the Poisson point process, or heuristically, since everything is determined from the Poisson point process, if you have only one point there, if you have a point far away, the underlying Poisson point process will have only one point. Which means that when you condition the process to have a point far towards the right side, uh, for you, far towards the <laughs> right side, uh, uh, so if you have a point far towards the right side, what is around it should be the, a copy of the decoration. So what you do is you define the decoration as what you see on the right side, when you condition the process to have a point far away, and then using that definition, you check that everything works. You use a freezing to deduce that indeed you can reconstruct the process that way. So essentially the key step is to, um, is to construct the reconstruction. There is a subtlety with reconstructing the shift. This is where extra conditions are needed, but I'm not going to discuss, uh, to discuss this anymore.